Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If there's any difficulty hearing me, just shout. Uh, basically, when anyone is asked to give a talk, it's usually helpful to have a guinea pig, and I'm the guinea pig today because I'm going to be a microcosm of anxiety and evolution. <laughs> So if you see me getting embarrassed, starting to sweat, fleeing the building, please have some sympathy because this is what our patients tend to feel most of the time. When I was thinking about uh, how to explain or how to talk about the anxiety disorders, it struck me that this is just such an enormous area that it'll be impossible in the space of 45 to 50 minutes to give uh, a comprehensive overview of all the different disorders. So what we'll do is look at some of the most common, those that affect our patients and loved ones, I suppose, most frequently, and also spend a little bit of time looking at how to recognize uh, these disorders as well as how to treat them. Most of us in today's world, the first thing we do is we look up the internet so, of course, I thought, well, how do we recognize an anxiety disorder? So I did just what everyone else does. I looked up the Internet and I found a really, really, I thought, quite compelling video from a mental health charity in uh, Australia, which is all about identifying the condition. flushes that confuse you when you're already confused enough. I am the one that raises the whip to your already racing heart. I am the tightening of your chest, the snowballing worries that feel like they might become an avalanche and can just bury you in an instant. My friend, I am the obsessive and I'm the compulsive. I'm the voice, you know the one. It's always questioning, questioning, questioning everything you do, everything you think. And I am every single staring eye that watches you. And every one of those places that you try so desperately to avoid. So, now that we have become acquainted, what are you going to do about it? That was from Beyond Blue, which was an Australian mental health organisation, and essentially the focus really was on recognising anxiety, recognising its presence, recognising its unwelcome visitation. So if we were to look at the different categories of anxiety, essentially it can be divided into the phobic anxiety disorders, and also 
The other anxiety disorders, which include panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and mixed anxiety and depressive disorder. And then lastly is obsessive compulsive disorder. The anxiety disorders have a very high impact on daily life. They cause considerable suffering for individuals and there's a very, very substantial economic impact also. The economic data that's quoted dates to uh, the late 1990s, but even by today's standards, you can see that that's an enormous amount of money, the annual expenditure that is quoted. All of the anxiety disorders tend to be associated with overlapping with other conditions, both anxiety spectrum and also mood disorders, substance misuse disorders and personality related difficulties. And because the diagnoses of the anxiety disorders are essentially based on subjective descriptions of symptoms, there is an inevitable overlap between these conditions. And comorbidity is just that, overlapping of conditions. The comorbidity or overlapping of these disorders does make the research data more difficult to understand and to interpret. In terms of the anxiety disorders, there are essentially seven principles that are important to consider. The firstly is diagnosis of the condition. The second is deciding whether or not a medication is required. And if a medication is required, what dosage, what the side effects may be that are relevant to take into consideration and to bear in mind, what the duration of treatment with a medication should be, when to discontinue and how to follow up, and also to consider the whole issue of psychological therapy and education. The first condition to look at is panic disorder. And the central feature of panic disorder is the occurrence of recurrent, unexpected, and therefore unpredictable panic attacks. And at least one of these attacks should be followed by a month or more of one or more of the following. This persistent concern about having additional attacks, we refer to this as anticipatory anxiety, Worry about the implication of the attack or its consequences, including a fear of losing control, a fear of having a heart attack, a fear of going crazy. And a significant change in behaviour associated with these attacks is commonplace. What are the typical symptoms of panic? Well, there are 13 separate symptoms, many of which will be familiar a whole range of bodily sensations such as palpitations, sweating, shaking, feelings of choking or shortness of breath, feelings of dizziness. Then there are psychic symptoms such as fear of loss of control, fear of going crazy, going mad. These are things that patients commonly report. Fear of dying during an attack numbness or tingling sensations, or getting hot or cold flushes, for example. As panic attacks develop and become more frequent, the sufferer begins to experience intense worry about the occurrence and the consequence of future attacks. And this fear can lead to avoidance of situations where attacks have occurred previously, and a sense that escape from such situations could be difficult, embarrassing, and this uh, can lead to avoidance, which is agoraphobia. In terms of the evolution of panic, we see that typically there's a background level of baseline anxiety, and then in response typically to an acute stress, panic attacks start. With repeated panic over time, fear of further attacks or anticipatory anxiety emerges, 
And this can lead on to avoidance behaviors, phobic avoidance or agoraphobia. What's more common than full-blown panic attacks would be what we call limited symptom attacks or sub-threshold panic attacks. And these are very, very similar to what I've already described, except that fewer symptoms are present. And about 40% of those with a diagnosis of panic disorder and agoraphobia have limited symptom attacks, and they're very, very common in the general community. It's important to note that people who experience limited symptom panic attacks are just the same as those who have full-blown panic. The distinction between them is really an arbitrary issue that we use clinically based largely on indicating severity. Panic disorder occurs in between 1 to 4% of the population. Subsyndromal or limited symptom attacks are most common. And the prevalence is between, they're most prevalent in the 25 to 44 year age group. They're at least twice as common in women as in men. The clinical course of panic disorder is very variable. Without treatment, the condition can run a chronic course, often with a debilitating nature. The average age of onset of panic disorder is between 20 and 30 years. The earlier the onset, the longer the clinical course, and the more complications that tend to arise. In terms of response to treatment, men and women are equally likely to experience remission of their symptoms with treatment, but women have been found to be twice as likely to suffer from recurrence in five-year follow-up studies. As with all the anxiety disorders, panic disorder has a very strong genetic component with vulnerability points on chromosome 6 or 16 and number 7 uh, having been reported. The majority of those with panic disorder have at least one other comorbid or concomitant psychiatric disorder. And the co-occurrence with other disorders is associated with more severe anxiety, with more severe depressive symptoms, and of great importance, higher rates of suicide attempts, which underlines the seriousness of this condition. Obviously, the more severe disorders, the more severe the impairment and the impact on quality of life. The treatment targets are to reduce the uh, number and intensity of panic attacks, to reduce the anticipatory anxiety, to treat underlying depression or other comorbidities, and to identify and treat agoraphobia. In terms of treatments, drug treatments, the antidepressant medications are the cornerstone of medication treatment, with all of the different groupings of antidepressants having been found to be effective. But with the newer generation antidepressants, the SSRI antidepressants and the SNRIs being the cornerstone. The tranquilizing medications such as benzodiazepines are of limited usefulness because of their addictive nature and the fact that they, uh, I suppose the body develops a tolerance to them. One thing about the usage of the newer generation antidepressants is that when one starts them, there can be an initial heightening of anxiety. And this is referred to as the jitteriness syndrome. So there's a rule of thumb which is followed, which is start the dose low, go slow, but keep going. So we tend to start at much lower dosages, typically half or less, the usual dosage that would be initiated, say, for example, in depression. But the dosage that's required to control symptoms in panic tends to be, on average, a little bit higher than in depressive illness. So that underlies the importance of keeping going with treatment. In terms of psychological therapy, Cognitive behaviour therapy is central to the management of panic. And there have been many studies confirming 
uh, its usefulness and its role. And the importance here, I suppose, is to help the patient understand the role of their thoughts in panic development and also to accept more benign interpretations of the bodily sensations. Combining medication and psychological therapy tends to produce the greatest uh, benefit and the most positive outcome. Moving on to agoraphobia. Agoraphobia is essentially a conditioned avoidance, a conditioned avoidance behavior secondary to the experience of spontaneous <coughs> panic or limited symptom panic attacks. There's an interrelated and often overlapping cluster of uh, phobias and fears, including fear of entering shops, fear of being in crowds, in public places, fear of traveling alone on public transport, such as trains, buses, or planes. And this essentially here just outlines what I've just described, the different diagnostic criteria. What's important here with agoraphobia is that the feared situations are avoided, or else are endured with considerable anxiety and distress. With panic disorder, agoraphobia has been found to be present uh, with a prevalence of up to a third, but with higher rates in the clinical samples, which is consistent with the more severely ill presenting for treatment. <coughs> Moving on to social anxiety. Social anxiety disorder is certainly the commonest of the anxiety disorders and it's involved a marked and persistent fear of being scrutinized by others in social situations. There's a fear that one's actions will cause the self to be humiliated or embarrassed, and a recognition that the fear is excessive and unreasonable. Exposure to the feared situation produces anxiety. And the feared situations are avoided or endured with considerable distress. Clearly, the avoidance behavior has a considerable impact in terms of day-to-day -day functioning, relationships, and there can be quite an impact on routine and also on quality of life. In terms of the clinical symptoms in social anxiety, it's very, very similar to what's experienced in panic. Blushing, sweating, shaking, palpitations, nausea, diarrhea. Physical symptoms including increased heart rate and blood pressure. Psychological symptoms, very maladaptive thoughts regarding social situations, particularly the fear of humiliation and behavioral symptoms, avoidance behaviors, avoidance of situations that one has associated with anxiety or that one is fearful of. And social anxiety can be divided into two groupings, the more severe, which is referred to as generalized social anxiety, uh, and the less severe specific anxiety uh, where individual situations, such as public speaking, for example, uh, are feared. The more severe form is by far the more disabling. It tends to be more genetic and to run in families and to be associated with greater complications. This uh, graphic illustrates typical situations uh, that are feared. Public speaking, presenting at meetings, attending parties, initiating conversations, eating in public or having to write in front of other people. With social anxiety disorder, it presents younger. In uh, clinical settings, it presents as commonly in men and in women, although in epidemiological studies, more women have been found to suffer from social anxiety. It's uh, 
reported to be more common in Caucasian populations, in the educated, and unsurprisingly in the unmarried, because if one is socially anxious, it's more difficult to be in social situations involving meeting other people. The clinical course of social anxiety, it typically comes on in the teenage years, but there tends to be a very long delay before people seek treatment. The mean age or the average age at which people present for treatment tends to be about 30. And oftentimes it runs a very chronic course, particularly if it has become complicated by other conditions, such as depression or substance misuse. There's a considerably increased risk of developing mood disorder, and there's also major uh, associated disabilities in terms of social and occupational functioning and consequently very high costs to society. This illustrates that pure social anxiety is actually relatively rare, that the vast majority are associated with at least one other psychiatric condition, whether that be an anxiety disorder, a mood disorder, a substance misuse disorder, or a personality-related problem. And you can see that multiple comorbidities or complications with social anxiety is uh, very, very prominent. In terms of medication treatments, most of the studies have looked at uh, relatively short-term treatment of the more severe generalized social anxiety with there being published evidence for all the different antidepressant classes, the tranquilizers such as benzodiazepines, the uh, anti-epileptic drug pregabalin, beta blockers and buspirone. The cornerstone to the treatment of social anxiety is the SSRI antidepressant grouping and there's good evidence across the board for the different members of this class. It's important to note that there's a very high rate of relapse with early withdrawal from medication. More recently, the anticonvulsant drug, pregabalin, has been found to be helpful in high dosage. And this was associated with significant reduction in social anxiety symptoms in sufferers. Psychological therapy for social anxiety includes cognitive behavioral therapy. And also there's interesting data on group social skills training. And this forms a component of one of the well-established treatments that are available, that's available here in Dublin. Moving on to generalized anxiety disorder. The key feature of generalized anxiety disorder is excessive anxiety or worry occurring consistently on most days over a period of at least six months. It's difficult to control. The anxiety or worries relate to several different subjects. It causes significant distress and or social impairment. And there must be at least three additional symptoms. Restlessness or muscle tension, poor concentration, irritability, muscle tension or sleep disturbance. And this slide illustrates basically the same, just dividing them into the physical and psychological correlates that are very common with generalized anxiety. The typical worries that occur in generalized anxiety would be worries around career, money, health of family and friends, home issues, time management issues. The sufferers recognize that the degree of worry, its extent and its intensity is excessive, but nonetheless, uh, that isn't sufficient to bring about reassurance and to diminish the symptoms. The lifetime prevalence of generalized anxiety in the US has been found to be between 4 and 
it's to be twice as common in women as in men, and to be more common in lower socioeconomic groupings, those, those who are isolated and in the elderly. As with all of the anxiety disorders, a very strong genetic contribution is uh, evident, and there's a shared genetic predisposition between generalized, uh, generalized anxiety and depressive illness. Unless treated, generalized anxiety tends to run a chronic course, either constant in nature or fluctuating with periods of improvement and relapse. The average age of onset uh, is between the teens and uh, early 20s. It can start off prepubertally, and it tends to be a long-running uh, condition, often persisting for 10 years or more. This graphic illustrates the background chronic anxiety level, with then periods of more intense symptoms which can last days or weeks at a time. In terms of medication treatments for generalized anxiety, there are treatments that start uh, take effect quickly, uh, tranquilizers such as the benzodiazepines, but they're of limited usefulness, uh, as already mentioned. There are the treatments that take longer to work, but are ultimately uh, more effective and more satisfactory. And they're principally the antidepressant grouping of medications and the non-benzodiazepine tranquilizer buspirone. The problem with benzodiazepines essentially is tolerance and addiction sedation, impairment of performance, and the fact that they do not treat comorbid conditions such as depression. I mentioned in longer term usage there can be dependency and also withdrawal symptoms, and there's a high rate of relapse after discontinuation of that type of medication. Central to a generalized anxiety management would be the newer generation antidepressants, the SSRIs and the SNRIs, the serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, vaccine, and more recently, geloxetine. As I mentioned when discussing panic, one has to be careful about the initial anxiety heightening impact of these treatments. So one starts at a lower dosage. <laughs> Cognitive behaviour therapy, once again, is the central psychological therapy that's useful in the treatment of generalised anxiety. And improvements have been reported uh, in up to 50 to 60% of patients in some of the studies mentioned there. There is also some evidence that the improvements with the psychological therapies can be more long-lasting than the improvements with medication, but the combination of the two approaches tends to provide greatest relief for sufferers. The final anxiety disorder grouping to talk about is obsessive-compulsive disorder, which is a condition characterized by recurrent obsessions or intrusive thoughts and compulsive or ritualistic behaviours. These are recognised as the person's own thoughts or anxieties but being unwelcome and distressing and the ritualised behaviours or compulsions cause considerable distress to sufferers and to their families. And OCD tends to run a chronic, very debilitating course unless it's treated. So it, an obsession, an obsession is a recurrent, intrusive thought or impulse or mental image or idea. They're experienced as intrusive, unwelcome and inappropriate by the sufferer. They cause considerable anxiety and distress. And they may be associated with the need to try to resist or repress the thought, which can lead on to compulsive behaviours or mental acts. <coughs> 
as I mentioned earlier, they're recognised by the individual as being a product of their own mind, but being unwelcome, distressing. Compulsions are recurrent or persistent behaviours which are undertaken to try to prevent or reduce anxiety or distress that's associated or emerges from the obsession of thoughts. Engaging in compulsive behaviours or rituals doesn't produce any form of gratification or pleasure for the sufferer, and it doesn't lead to any useful results, although it may be undertaken to try to prevent some dreaded event occurring in the belief that this will happen. Common examples of obsessions would be fears of contamination, doubting, fears of behaving aggressively or perpetrating some form of harm, uh, sexual thoughts, thoughts about some aspect of bodily function, religious thoughts, or preoccupations with neatness, symmetry, order, etc. And common examples of compulsions would include checking behaviours, cleaning behaviours, counting rituals, sometimes the need to ask questions or a need to confess, and behaviours associated with neatness, symmetry, order. OCD has been found to have a lifetime prevalence in the general population of between 1 and 3 percent, and it's the sixth most common psychiatric disorder in the United States. OCD is different from all other anxiety disorders in terms of its gender ratio. All of the other anxiety disorders have been found to be more common in women, but OCD is at least equally uh, common in men and women, with some studies suggesting a male predominance, and certainly in childhood uh, there are more boys suffering from OCD than girls. The vast majority of people with OCD present with symptoms before the age of 18, which is considerably younger than some of the other anxiety disorders such as panic. Just as with the other anxiety disorders, there's a very, very strong genetic component. OCD tends to be a persistent condition and long-term treatment is usually required. If it's not treated, it can impact significantly on quality of life for the patient themselves, for their families, their friends, and have impacts also in the workplace. OCD is a seriously disabling condition with major impacts on academic achievement of sufferers, career aspirations, work performance, impact on relationships, these disorders take their toll on families and friends, a huge impact on self-esteem, and in a study by Hollander on those suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder, 13% of the subjects reported having attempted suicide secondary to their OCD. But with treatment, Hollander's study found uh, 62% improved quality of life and in 43% improved ability to work and study. A big problem with OCD is the length of time between onset of symptoms and people presenting for treatment, with an average delay of 17 years, which is absolutely enormous. And reasons that have been put forth for this delay have been the failure to recognise the symptoms as being part of a treatable illness. Also, the fact that symptoms are often deeply, uh, uh, sufferers often tend to be very deeply ashamed of their symptoms and therefore conceal them. They may think that the sort of distressing, intrusive thoughts that they suffer are in some way perverse, 
tests are abnormal, which of course is untrue. Oftentimes there can be a misdiagnosis due to the fact that there can be an overlap with other disorders. And sadly, OCD was often thought to be resistant to treatment and that introduced a certain nihilism that there was an assumption, oh well, there isn't anything to be done, which of course is actually fundamentally erroneous. There's a huge comorbidity with depression, with major depressive illness being the most common comorbid disorder. And up to two thirds of those with diagnosis of OCD experience an episode of major depression, usually secondary to the obsessive compulsive condition itself. There are certain similarities between the two conditions, but they are separate. An important issue is the overlap between OCD and tick disorders, in that up to 40% of juveniles with OCD are also found to have tick disorders. There is an increased rate of Tourette syndrome in relatives of patients with OCD, and about 7% of those with OCD have a tick disorder. The medication treatments for OCD, essentially the serotonin boosting antidepressants are uh, to the uh, centre of treatment, including the serotonin specific reuptake inhibitors, the serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, the old tricyclic clomipramine, which was the initial gold standard, and the newer drug mirtazapine. It's important to remember that onset of action is delayed in a significant minority, so one needs to keep going with the treatment, and it's recommended that an adequate duration should allow for a 12-week trial before coming to a decision as to whether or not the treatment is impacting, which is an awful lot longer than people realise. And this is an important point because people commonly get disillusioned or assume that the treatment isn't working or their doctors assume so. The first treatment uh, pharmacologically uh, in OCD, the most gold standard I should say was the tricyclic drug clomipramine, which is still used and known under the trade name anaphenol, although this tended to be associated with a lot of difficult side effects sleepiness, weight gain, uh, falls in blood pressure on standing up, etc. Whereas the newer drugs, the SSRIs, the SNRIs and mirtazapine, tend to be better tolerated. And all of the SSRIs have been shown to be effective in clinical trials in the treatment of OCD. It is important to remember the cases that are resistant to treatment or so classified as so. And it is important to know that there are strategies that also help in this scenario. Changing to different medication types, augmenting with atypical antipsychotics, even intravenous medication. One strategy that has been reported to be particularly helpful has been adding in the atypical antipsychotic or the new generation antipsychotic, risperidone. And this has been reported to be especially helpful in cases that have patients suffering from horrific mental imagery. They tended to respond fastest to this addition. In cases of tick disorders, uh, where OCD occurs with a tick disorder, adding in an antipsychotic, traditionally pimazide or haloperidol, has been found to be uh, greater in impact than using the antidepressant on its own, and uh, newer generation antipsychotics are also used in this way. Benzodiazepines are occasionally used in the treatment of OCD. One specifically called clonazepam has been found to have a specific anti-obsessional impact. But again, this is not a first-line uh, choice because of the risks of addiction and also withdrawal symptoms.
and in terms of longer term treatment, the broad range of antidepressants, the SSRIs and the older drug clomipramine have all been studied. And because of the nature of this condition, long-term treatment is commonly required, as symptoms tend to recur within weeks of discontinuing drug therapy in a significant percentage. The older drug clomipramine may sometimes be effective in lower dosage in this maintenance phase, but with the newer drugs we tend to continue with the full therapeutic dosage that is required to give remission of symptoms. And as with the other anxiety disorders, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is uh, central to the psychological management of OCD. CBT or cognitive therapy involves identifying and monitoring obsessional thoughts, challenging negative appraisals. It involves exposure and ritual prevention, experiments behaviorally, and also modification of cognitive assumptions. Studies have shown that one can get equal impacts with SSRI medications and with cognitive therapy, but combining the two approaches tends to give the most favorable outcome. So that's been a general canter through the uh, broad categories. So we will uh, take a break Yes. And it gives people a chance to formulate their questions and we can uh, reconvene. Thank you. Thank you.